It is my pleasure to welcome everybody to tonight's program being held in honor of Armenian Genocide Commemoration Day. Um, what I would like to do first is just introduce myself. My name is Adara Goldberg and I am the director of the Holocaust Resource Center of Kane University. And it is very special to me as somebody who was trained at one of the only universities for my graduate work that has a chair in Armenian Genocide Studies at Clark. I'm just so very proud um, that I get to be here and that I have the pleasure um, to introduce you know, both our keynote speaker tonight, but first to welcome a colleague of mine from the university, Jan Balakian, who is going to offer a few words of welcome and tell you a little bit about what's going on at Kane. Thanks, Adara. Uh, can you all hear me? I just got out of class, so I'm just uh, switching gears from Lorraine Hansberry to the Armenian Genocide. So Adara asked me to speak about my family connection to the Armenian Genocide. And so here it goes. In the 70s, my Aunt Gladys, my mother's oldest sister, actually my mother's sitting right here with me. The pandemic brought us together this year. Um, my Aunt Gladys pulled out an old document from her parents' desk called Claim Against Foreign Governments. And it listed all of the family members that she lost during the Armenian Genocide in 1915. And she filed it in Newark, New Jersey in 1919, uh, but nothing ever came of it. And I was too young to understand. And my brother, however, a writer, uh, became obsessed with this document and it ignited his excavation of our family history. And the claim is reproduced in his memoir, Black Dog of Fate. And um, I also, when I was cleaning out my Aunt Lou's closet, I found my grandmother's inspection ticket when she arrived on um, uh, the SS New York. And so in any case, no one had ever really told us about it. And the New Jersey suburbs were really a place for my parents to forget about their parents' sad past and their trauma. And my father was a doctor here in Teaneck and was immersed in sports and invented a drink called Sport Aid. And so really our whole life was about school and sports. And then after the publication of Black Dog of Fate, readers started asking my brother Peter, uh, the author about the mentioning of my great uncle, our great uncle, a bishop on the Balakian side of the family. And there was a memoir that he had written called Armenian Golgotha about his eyewitness account of the Armenian genocide. Well, none of us had ever heard about, I had never heard about him. I never knew he was involved in this. And he disguised himself as a German train conductor and finally made it back home to what was then Constantinople. I had not realized that April 24, the official day of commemoration of the, the genocide was the day in which the Ottoman Turks arrested poets, journalists, clergy, intellectuals, benefactors, teachers, um, in order to begin what would become the first modern genocide. And I came to understand that to mean that in order to eradicate the Armenians, the Ottoman Turks wanted to cut the head off or rip the tongue out, whatever you would like to call it, because those would be the people who would write about it, disseminate the news about these crimes against humanity. And so in his memoir, I was just reviewing it. My great uncle, um, Krikor Balakian, uh, calls April 24 the night of Gethsemane. Um, and he writes, on the night of Saturday, April 24, 1915, groups of Armenians had just been arrested in the suburbs and neighborhoods of the capital. Uh, Blood-colored military buses and then a small steamboat were transporting us to the central prison. The night smelled of death, the sea was rough, and our hearts were full of terror. Um, and so we had no idea, he writes, where we were going, and they sink 
into fear and despair. Uh, he writes, we were terrified of the unknown and longing for comfort. We were all searching for answers, asking what all of this meant and pondering our fate. And so those are the two bookends of my family history that taught me that the Armenian genocide was the first modern genocide in the sense that it was perpetrated by a nationalist ideology. It used a state bureaucracy. My oldest brother is very adamant that I understand this. Um, advanced technology it used and communication and parliamentary apparatus for the purpose of targeting and eliminating a particular group uh, of people. So I, if, if Raphael Lemkin's 1944 definition of genocide had been coined when my grandmother filed her claim in 1919, I wonder if my grandmother's claim might have been answered. So I thought, uh, Adara said, well, here's the chance for you to, to plug your course. And I have to confess that I I hardly feel like a scholar of the Armenian Genocide. I learn a great deal from my brother who is the scholar of this field, but um, I, I will be offering the course in the fall. And um, my students just won uh, a, a grant to produce my new play that deals with a college student who discovers the source of his trauma. And, um, and so, uh, that play will be produced next spring, and we welcome you uh, to that. And uh, with that, I just want to say uh, that I might not have put all of those uh, things together if Adara had not invited me to do so, but I want to um, welcome and honor Harry Millian, who is a third generation survivor. Thank you so much. And now I am going to take a moment to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. Mr. Harry Millian is the vice chair of the Armenian Society for Studies on Stress and Genocide, Meaningful World, which is an international NGO affiliated with the United Nations. The organization promotes education, empowerment, and nurturing of the emotional intelligence through generational healing, um, helping to transform emotional wounds to, to positive lessons learned. The group educates and holds monthly workshops, free support groups, presentations all across the tri-state area at schools, um, churches, and a synagogue, and they hold an annual essay and film contest that attracts student submissions from all across the tri-state. Harry has been interviewed by NPR as a community activist and includes the teaching of international cultural awareness um, at all levels um, of education. And so I am now going to turn things over to Harry to share the story of his family. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Adara. Thank you uh, to King University's Holocaust Research Center, Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Facing History and Ourselves, and of course, Meaningful World. Thank you for uh, senators and congressmen to be here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, each and every one of you for your presence and I will begin this presentation. Uh, let me just put this on the side and uh, where do we go? Share screen? Are we good? Yes. Okay, so um, knowing our collective histories Sharing life experiences validates the integrity of who we are, especially for all those that had no voice, no restorative justice. 
And knowing the history, knowing their history gives us the capacity to understand the bigger picture of mankind's inhumanity or kindness as better informed citizens sharing commonalities, we can prevent atrocities. But first, let me give you a small sampling of democratic Armenia. So here is Mount Ararat. Armenia has a recorded history of 3,500 years. It's a beautiful, welcoming country. It has a hospitable location on a silk route within the Caucasus region. It is considered one of the safest places in the world with a very low crime rate. Biblical Mount Ararat that you see in front of you where Noah's Ark settled and Noah basically okay. <laughs> came down in Armenia to grow grapes. So we have the oldest winery. We have great reverence for this mountain and the monastery that you see in, in the center to the right is Horvira, which is at least 1300 years old. Armenia is the first country to adopt Christianity as the state religion in 301 AD. We built the first Christian cathedral in the world and at least 3000 most beautiful churches and medieval monasteries. Yerevan, the capital, is a cool and funky city. Many buildings are made with a volcanic sto stone tooth. It has live music cafes, concert halls, theaters, restaurants. Armenians are known for their architecture, their first-rate cognac, wines, yogurt, twisted cheese, ancient cuisine, and lavash bread, which is on UNESCO's heritage list. On April 24th, Armenians worldwide, we commemorate their genocide of 1915-1923, where we lose uh, one and a half million Armenians. To this, I say, Mr. President, this April 24th and thereafter, demonstrate the courage to call it correctly, the Armenian genocide. We often ask, why does history keep repeating itself? Do we need to do a better job of teaching and remembering atrocities of indigenous people? Our grandmother used to say, you cannot understand the deepness of the wound unless the knife touches your own bone. This holds true for any trauma, starting from bullying to slavery and genocide. Armenians have been targeted for their identity. They were absorbed by the Ottoman Turks invasion of the 15th century. They continue to be the subjects of unequal and unjust treatment. Starting in 1894-1896, the Ottoman Turkish Empire kills 250,000 Armenians. In uh, 1908, the young Turks fighting the caliphate with the bloody Sultan Hamid cost another 30,000 Armenians' lives. As that wasn't enough, the young Turks planned and executed the greatest of all crimes in revenge against Christian Europe under cover of World War I. Despite being defeated, but let's go to the map. The left side, the map, 1920, the Treaty of Sèvres, which uh, President Wilson basically granted all the territories you see in stripes and present-day Armenia is the red, orangey red, which is today, which was, and today the Democratic Republic was part of the Soviet Union, but today it's a free democratic country. But in 1923, the Treaty of Lausanne with uh, the new Republic and Ataturk, they forgive everybody and Turkey attacks and takes back all those territories. So uh, basically, 
promise reforms, instead of promise reforms, successive government just continue agitating violence. Many Christians, including Dink, he a newspaper editor and was killed in 2007 just for speaking reconciliation and historical truth. The Hranding Foundation showed that Armenians were the most targeted group in hate speech in, in the Turkish media, much of, it's re, much of it related to the truth of genocide. And that is why the Armenian genocide has been labeled as a double genocide sacrifice because of continuous denial by its inheriting governments. Harry, you're muted. Unmute, okay. Uh, why the picture stopped? Okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, I wanted to share one of my memorable encounters that I had with a young Turkish uh, student many years ago, and this happened at the uh, Holocaust uh, Genocide Museum in downtown Manhattan. And Professor Aras Sarafian was giving a presentation about how he was trying to reconcile Armenian and Turkish histories about the deportations. And at the end of the uh, presentation, uh, there were some questions and answers. And this young uh, Turkish student raised his hand and he asked, how can the Armenians ask for those lands in Anatolia when they were never the majority in those lands. Uh, I believe Professor Sarafian was caught off guard and he gave him a short response, which uh, the student didn't feel that was enough of an answer. So as the presentation finished, I went over to the young man and the young man was joined by two, two or three other young men. and. Uh, uh, when they saw me coming, they said right away, how can you say it's a genocide? We were fighting on all three fronts. And I said, very easy. 20 years later, Hitler, your admirer, did the same thing to the Jews. He was fighting on all three fronts as well. But then I asked the uh, student, I said, instead of debating the issue, would you dialogue with me? And he said, okay, so we went together walking and uh, I said, I believe uh, your question did not get a full answer. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, how, first of all, I asked him, I said, what do you do for a living? And he said, well, I'm a student uh, of history at Columbia University. And I said, fine. I said, how many years do you think Armenians were in Anatolia or the way Armenians call it, Armenian Highlands. Well, he said, I think it's between 200 and maybe 300 years. I said, okay, I am going to try to give it in a way that you'll understand. I said, uh, do you remember uh, the Crusades? And he said, yes. I said, do you remember Saladin? And he said, yes. I said, do you remember Mohammed? And he said, yes. So I said, do you remember that Saladin granted the right to Armenians and other people of the Bible to govern for self-government? And he said, yes. So I said, and, and Mohammed was in the seventh century. And I said, if you had another 2,500 years, that's how long Armenians were Anatolia. So uh, what the Turks forget, uh, because they invaded the region in 1453, when Con Constantinople became Istanbul, the Silk Route to China and India was blockaded by the Turks. 
So that hastened the discovery of actually of America. So to alleviate this young man's burden, I told him that governments in generally try to skim through the dark pages of their history. So consequently, we parted in a very friendly manner. And I always take the opportunity to dialogue with uh, other Turks. Armenian genocide re remains relevant today still as a hate crime, resulting in gener generational trauma. It was, as uh, Jan said, the first racial, religious, systematic genocide of the 20th century. During World War I, did you know that the second most important event in the media of about 140 detailed articles in the New York Times was about the starving Armenians? Did you know that $100 million was collected by American students, mostly? And this was for the Armenian orphans. That was a huge amount at that time. During World War II, 20 years later, Turkey again repeats its alliance and joined Nazi Germany. Today, the Republic of Turkey, the successor state of the Ottoman Empire, <clears throat> still denies the Armenian genocide ever happened, even when their German allies confirmed it. Their behaviors continue violating human dignity through discrimination, demonizing, ethnic cleansing. The mission, of course, was to erase the leadership, heritage, identity, even the names of the towns. Not only a policy of extermination, but one of confiscation, because it was the grandest of thefts of all belongings, covered up by continuous propaganda. Today, these deniers are so emboldened that they are fearless in characterizing the minority survivors are as remnants of the sword, in addition to other insults. The ethnic cleansing including all, included all financial wealth, assets in banks, countless businesses, land properties, homes, social cultural centers, 1500 schools, 2,000 churches and monasteries. Nothing was sacred to escape the violence. The oppressors came out on the losing side of World War I, but not under a deficit, and the only country to be rewarded with a surplus. That strategy continues in manipulating our memories and history by creating alternative facts. But what is the fundamental question of genocide? The root of it is, do all human beings have equal value? Can we recognize the inclusiveness of other cultures and communities? I would say it's simply an issue of conscience or lack of it. So we need to engage much beyond the politics. The word genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jewish lawyer, to describe the extermination of the Armenians in an environment of intolerance, economic confusion. So Monterlikian saw his whole family killed, but survived and later killed one of the masterminds in Berlin. He was arrested, tried, and found innocent by a German court. His reflection, why is the killing of an individual a greater crime than the killing of millions? Lemkin believed the right word genocide adopted by the UN in 1948 would ignite people to stop these crimes. The resolution, although clearly retroactive, Armenians still await its activation. On the other hand, I must say that the descendants of the perpetrators do not bear guilt unless they choose to justify and identify themselves with it. Other writers, righteous Turks, soldiers, politicians, government employees, heroic VIPs, and some Kurds 
did show compassion and oppose the deportation directives. So I feel we must honor the memory of Turkish heroes who refused to obey orders. We must honor the memory of Turkish heroes who refused to obey orders. They are the Turkish Schindlers. One of the first books about the genocide was written by Franz Werfel in 1933, 40 Days of Musada, of which I have an original copy dated 1933. Uh, this, was based, uh, this was based on the survivor's account of the six villages that uh, united, and they were just about 250 men uh, and the women and children, of course, uh, to defend themselves on Musadah, really uh, translating to the Moses Mountain. And the book became very popular, especially in the Jewish Polish ghettos during the Holocaust. The takeaway was that Armenians were killed, not because they resisted, but because they surrendered. Religion was not the only reason. It was money, racism, envy, greed, contempt, and economic resentment. The lack of a unified effort to punish these oppressors allowed German officers to justify violence against the Jews in World War II because two decades earlier, they had co-signed some of the death march orders against the Armenians. So Hitler stated a few days before invading Poland, who after all speaks of remembering the Armenians. Turkey had become the role model to emulate and for the Nazis cleansing of the Jewish population. Uh, by the way, the Armenians are listed by the World Jewish Council as righteous among nations for rescuing Jews during the Holocaust. At this time, I would like to invite my daughter Lara, a fourth generation survivor, to read a portion from Grandma Giuliani's family testimonial account. Take it away, Lara. Okay, thank you. Um, so my mother, Juliet, is named after her grandmother, Guliane. The name Juliet translates to Guliane in Armenian. Um, Guliane, my great grandmother, lived with us for 12 years. She was a mentor, a peacemaker. She showered us with unconditional, constant love. She taught us to reconcile and forgive, to be grateful and to stand side by side together. Not everyone is blessed to have such a person in their lives, but if you are, you know it. And we definitely cherished her while she was in our lives. I remember the fluffiness of her silver shiny hair as soft as marshmallows. She was barely even five feet tall, but had a huge presence, quiet, but powerful. There was so much history and stories beneath the beautiful wrinkles that lined her forehead and cheeks with the softest yet most piercing gray blue green eyes. It is her survivor account that begins the story of our family about a century ago during the Armenian genocide of 1915 when 1.5 million Armenians were slaughtered. We have no record of most of our ancestors because of the Armenian genocide. This is a very abridged version of an incredible survival story of my great grandmother, Guliane Minasyan Sionyan. The year was 1915. Guliane, my great grandmother, was seven years old, living in Sivri Hisaj, a town and district of Eskisher province, located in the central Anatolian region of present day Turkey. This area was predominantly populated by hardworking and successful indigenous Christian Armenians at the time. Um, they were builders, traders, and manufacturers, and educators. As the young Turks had wrestled power from the Ottoman Turkish government, Guliane's whole world would come tumbling down. A persecuting jihad was legalized as the government decided Ottoman Turkey would be for Turks only. 
and nearly all Armenians were immediately disarmed, uprooted from their homes, and ultimately murdered. This was a massive extermination. Personal belongings were confiscated, stolen, or destroyed. Homes, businesses, churches, and schools were all appropriated or eradicated. Just imagine for generations having lived on your ancestral lands and suddenly you are the target of absolute annihilation. Guliana's father had just mysteriously died of typhoid. Soldiers came and loaded Guliana, her mother Makruhi, and four brothers, including a three-month-old baby, into cattle cars. Thousands of Armenians were packed into these cattle car cars to the point of suffocation. A few hours later, they arrived at a location and were told to march into the desert. This was the march into oblivion where most would never return from. With Turkish soldiers and gendarmes on horseback equipped with whips, Gulyanik continued to march, hungry, dehydrated, and exhausted. She pushed on, she, she pushed on by her mother's side. Time seemed to be an unending nightmare. As they arrived at Eregli Konya, there was a stench that was impossible to forget, the smell of countless bloated dead bodies. As they passed a river, the water ran red with blood from the butchered bodies that had been tossed into it. The bellies of pregnant women were knifed and ripped open. The hot air reeked of death it quickly became clear that the wholesale cruelty that was being perpetrated on, our, on Armenians was being done with overt complicity and encouragement from the Turkish Ottoman government, headed by the Young Turks and the Committee for Union and Progress, the CUP. Now, if you remember, Guyana's youngest brother, Rafi, was only three months old. But with no food for him and no ability to nurse, since their mother was completely dehydrated, the baby was screaming from hunger and thirst, while soldiers kept whipping whomever they chose. The long whip sounded like bolts of lightning. The horses' hooves kicked up dry dust. The broiling sun rose higher in the sky. They heard marchers ahead yelling that babies were being pierced on the edge of bayonets. Some of the women frantically started urging Guyana's mother to throw baby Rafi over into the river. They knew they would perish, but perhaps baby Rafi would be spared and would not die under the knife. Guyana's mother was circled by this echoing chorus that added to her mental anguish and confusion. Was there any way to spare this child from certain death? It was clear there was none. She knew she had to throw the baby into the river. Her heart ripped out of her chest as she did what she knew she had to do to spare him of the coming torture. When they approached the village town of Rasulain on the border of Syria, everyone was exhausted from the barbarous treatment as other groups of hungry and tortured Armenians arrived at the site. Guliane soon realized this was where everyone was to be concentrated or exterminated. She witnessed the raping and abduction of Armenian women daily here. One night, a force of butcher killing squads attacked their tents. They rode in on horseback, whipping swords, slashing the posts of the tents and having them collapse on the people beneath, making them disoriented and defenseless targets. Those that tried to escape were immediately slain. Even the courageous few did not stand a chance against the soldiers who clearly enjoyed the hideous ecstasy of murder. As Guliana's brothers, Garabed, Hagop, and Harant attempted to protect her and her mother, they were trampled to death, crushed by the stampede of armed Turkish soldiers on horseback and killed in the slaughter. She watched her brothers be murdered, and then the remaining Armenian men were assembled tortured, dismembered, and slaughtered with no mercy. Following the gruesome death of her brothers, for three days, Guyane stayed close to her mother's side while her mother was unable to speak. Having witnessed such horrors, her heart completely broken. Unable to continue, she whispered to Guyane that she was dying. She instructed her daughter to see if any Armenian converts could help her, even if she had to beg them. 
The next morning, Guliana's mother died and she was completely alone, abandoned, an orphan, and only seven years old. She went over to the camp and in one of the tents tried to be helpful to another family as she begged them for bread. She was dirty, raggedy, and weak, but they were scared, scared to help her, afraid that they were accounted for and adding one more would make trouble for them. One of them pointed her to a communal bakery for shelter at the edge of the village. It was, it was getting dark. It started to rain and thunder, but Guliana went ahead looking for some glimmer of hope. There was no one to help her. She was all alone. All she knew was that maybe she could find some shelter or warmth there if she continued. And finally, much to her amazement, she found the oven and no one was there. It was above ground and still warm. Exhausted, she opened the oven's door and crawled her tiny self into it, into the deepest, darkest part of the oven, searching for whatever bit of warmth or crumbs she could find. As she took a deep sigh, she smelled the sweet smell of lavash bread that had been baked there earlier in the day, only to realize there was one round lavash that had miraculously been forgotten or left behind. She grabbed this joyous loaf and treasured each bite, mumbling over and over, thanks to God. One day in Rasulain, the horizon got unexpectedly better for Guliane. She saw a man wearing a fez tassel hat, elegantly dressed with a remarkably kind demeanor, come to the camp. He was a doctor, accompanied by two very beautiful and elegantly dressed women companions. Emaciated and exhausted, Guliane suddenly lit up. She thought she recognized him from the town she grew up in and immediately ran towards him, grabbing his leg. She was convinced he must have come for her and she begged him to take her to back to her, back to her village. The doctor was named Sami Bey. It was a well-respected Turkish name in politics and the military. He had come to the camp with two stunningly beautiful female companions in search of orphans. These women, with the help of the doctor, were on a mission to rescue children, and fortunately for Guliane, she had come in contact with them. The doctor agreed to take her. They left the camp on a horse and wagon on their way to Diyarbakir. The doctor had hired a Turkish coachman who knew the roads, and as they traveled, they came across three gigantic crater-like holes. The coachman said that this was where Armenians were thrown into the craters on top of each other and buried alive. The two women accompanying the doctor fought back their tears as they rode past the massive graves. Guliana soon after found out the big secret regarding these two women, that they were indeed Armenian, most likely converts or had been abducted, but their identity as Armenians had to be completely hidden for their safety. Guliana was one of the many few who made it out of the Rasulin concentration death camp alive. Within months of her leaving the camp, the tents where the children were housed, were doused with gasoline and the kids were burned alive. Over 250,000 Armenians were systematically killed in Rasulin camp alone. For some time, Guliane was under the safety of Sami Bey and his Armenian companions until they traveled by train toward Istanbul where they were separated from Sami Bey. At 11 years old, Guliane once again went through an excruciating loss when she was separated from the two Armenian companions. She struggled to survive, to find food and shelter, and for the bare everyday necessities. She was handed down from one family to the next for several more years. With the help of a loving Greek family and the Armenian church, Guliane was eventually reunited with her uncle in her native Eskishir, at 14 years old, she found a passage out of Turkey with her uncle and finally got to Bulgaria via cattle car. At the age of 18, her uncle introduced her to Ova Nesionyan, who became her husband a year later, and together they had a daughter. She immigrated to Paris in 1968. 
She made it her life's mission to help the needy and feed the less fortunate, especially serving thousands of underprivileged children. She dedicated her life to serving the church and faithfully acknowledging that God had always protected her and been by her side. She was our angel on earth, and it's been an honor to share a little bit of her powerful story with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara. Harry, was there anything else you wanted to add now? To unmute, okay, next picture. Oops, we lost it, okay, okay, screen sharing. Okay, we lost the pictures. Anyway, uh, when, uh, when we are better aware of history, I believe that we can better understand present behavior of people around us. But for example, when you ask what happened to the Armenians, to somebody that comes from these countries, instead of owning, owning up to their history, you will get a straight face excuse such as, well, it was wartime, or we did not slaughter the Armenians, they slaughtered us. But uh, just two years ago, they were running a public play in the Turkish middle and high schools titled Migration of Turks Fleeing from Armenians. That is how hate-filled lies indoctrinate. They become truth in young minds and become their identity. In their old textbook, Armenians and Jews were people of the book, were people of the book. Now they are infidels and so are Americans. Recently, a friend said that uh, we should have uh, the second amendment. Unfortunately, the right to bear arms was also forbidden for all minorities. The ability to protect oneself was the first thing they take away. Or they would give you a reason like, well, yes, Turkey committed a genocide. If they don't behave, we'll do it again. But then again, don't you need our air bases? Another excuse would be create doubt. What makes you an expert on Turkish history? And the answer, of course, is the archives of the US, Germany, France, Austria, the Vatican, missionaries, and at least two dozen other countries. Even their own Turkish military tribula tribunals of 1919 reflected that these atrocities, this genocide was committed. A political apologist would say, the relocation of Armenians in Eastern Anatolia was the most reasonable action that could be taken in such a period. They clearly omit to mention that the government orders never mention final destination. In addition, the official Young Turks party their orders emphasized no survivors. No one was to be spared from exhaustion, hunger, thirst, or epidemics in concentration or these extermination camps. Continuous lies cannot free its people from the shame and guilt they allow so that reconciliation can help and they can become more than they can be. Persecutors, persecutors have learned to turn themselves into victims by not allowing critical thinking and free speech at home. In their own academic curriculum, they demand blind obedience, yet in front of foreigners, they declare their goodness to all minorities. But if you ask them, why can't local citizen minorities get a public service job? a history teacher, policeman, or simply a government clerk. 
Also, government controls their religion. Courts are not obliged to follow due process. The state uses group identity markers to control society. Minorities are forced to conceal their true identity, Turkify their names, and use pseudonyms. People are encouraged to snitch upon each other. Imagine going to your doctor with a different name, hiding your identity. I came across an imam uh, not too long ago, and I asked to, uh, to meet him in his office a few days later, and he told me, I'm sorry, but I can't because I'm going to uh, Turkey tomorrow. So I asked him, I said, are you vacationing? No, he said, I have to go because my family is in jail. So I couldn't resist myself. So I told him, I said, you mean to tell me the Turks have not changed in over a century? So um, just look at present day hypocrisy. Turkey supports a Palestinian nation, but not a Kurdish nation. Amnesty International says that Turkey is the world's largest prison for journalists. They defend the freedom of worship, speak out against segregation, intolerance in the West to ban it in their own homelands. They, pull out of, they also pulled out of the tree combating violence against women recently based on religious grounds. We allow them to violate our own human rights, you also U.S. sanctions to weaken NATO, and we still continue praising their democracy. They know us better than we know them. Our U.S. government responds to short-term strategic material interest instead of sustainable long-term American human rights and religious ideals. To this, Churchill referred, referred to this as feeding the croc, hoping that we will be eaten last. When we sweep genocide denial, when we sweep history aside, it comes back as a forgotten lesson. Continuous genocide denial makes Turkey susceptible to other genocides. The most recent genocide, however, you may or may not have heard because the first step for persecutors is to isolate the discourse in the media. The majority of Armenians in the Democratic Republic of Artsakh, which is right along Armenia, became independent on the basis of self-determination 30 years ago when the Soviet Union fell apart. But on September 27 of 2020, just last year, motivated by territorial ambitions and pan-Turkism, Azerbaijani armies backed by the Turkish military and over 2,000 paid jihadist mercenaries conducted indiscriminate systematic attacks on the Armenian Republic of Artsakh also known as Nagorno-Karabakh. In 45 days, they captured half of Artsakh using banned weapons on civilians, such as cluster bombs, white phosphorus that burns the body, and killer drones. This barbar barbaric invasion resulted in bombing of schools, homes, hospitals, churches, accompanied by inhumane paid beheadings and mutilations. An obvious assault on cultural, historical, religious heritage, some of it dating back to the first century BC. About 4,000 Armenians were killed, 100,000 were displaced, as the world was busy with a pandemic and elections. Here is a short account of one Maral Najarian, a 49-year-old civilian who happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. She was taken prisoner and kept for four months in Azerbaijani jails, where she would always find a razor blade on her beds. Obviously intentional. 
But her prayer of hope was, if I die, they win. By surviving, I win. Many prisoners are still not released. This battle lost in Armenia or Artsakh is a loss against democracy. The targeted Armenians were subjected to unspeakable inhumane treatments and deserve to be recognized internationally and the criminals must face consequences. Unfortunately, misinformation, disinformation have become an industry. Players, Turkey and Azerbaijan clearly are committing crimes against humanity and violating universal principles. They defend themselves by paying dozens of US-based public relation companies and even universities, big bucks, to spread their propaganda in both our educational and political system. One example, to return to the US F-35 jet program that Turkey was manufacturing, pieces for, Turkey is paying $750,000 to lobbyists for strategic advice and outreach to US authorities. In prevention, again, I ask an end to US complicity and I ask President Biden this April 24th to make the historical record clear and accurate. Call it correctly, the Armenian genocide. We also need historical knowledge in our leadership. Applied history would take a current predicament and try to identify analogs from the past so they can make accurate decisions and have real strategies. The question remains, how do we humanize persecutors? How do we convince so-called allies to stop teaching hate in their schools whereas we teach tolerance, diversity, and nonviolence. The antidote to radicalism is, to, is in recognizing the problem with effective methods, disempowering lies so that they will not control us. There should not be a middle ground towards injustice. Garo Pailan, a member of the Turkish parliament said, only a democratic Turkey could face to its past for collective healing. The international community must realize that recognizing genocide will prevent its recurrence by denialists and perpetrators. We need to hold our political representatives to their word to stop cover-ups for perpetrators and use economic, diplomatic means to enforce international norms. Famous Armenians, they go from the Kardashians to Nubar Afeyan. Nubar Afeyan is the co-founder and chairman of Moderna, saving lives with the COVID-19 vaccine. As a small country which lost 90% of its territory, Armenia needs more than friends. It needs allies. It is about social responsibility and compassion from each one of us for the human rights of another human being. If we believe that life is not simply about existing and if never again is to be true, then enough of us need to say enough by standing in meaningful unity simply because it impacts not only one culture but our entire civilization. Genocide prevention is bigger than the job of a few. Education, remembrance, and speaking truth to justice at all levels must be part of our humanity. In finale, as we say in meaningful world, when one helps another, both become stronger. So we urge you to take a small step in signing our petition, which is a change.org, protect indigenous nations. And I'm sorry, we lost the uh, slides. Thank you for listening. Take it away. Any questions? 
Thank you, Harry. I went ahead and shared the link with everyone in the chat box. So if you're interested in signing the petition, feel free to click on the link sent. Lara, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. How can we get how can we get this like this whole war that's going on? How can we get it more out in, into the public? Like I was just uh, just saying to myself, like I don't care about these things on television. I watch the BBC all the time. I watch different news channels. Yeah. And don't hear about this stuff. How come? What's what's going on? I I, I think uh, as I said, there is a lot of uh, manipulations from uh, persecutors and and denialists. Because uh, every time we come close to having this acknowledged, uh, even uh, with the last president, the Senate, the Congress passed it unanimously, but the president didn't sign it. Before him, Barack Obama, he meant well, even before he, uh, when he was a candidate, before he became president, he said it must be acknowledged. And when he became president, they manipulated him, they, whatever they did, but they changed his mind. Right. So I think uh, we lose our sense of righteousness sometimes by listening too much to those that manipulate us. And we allow ourselves to dream, drift into manipulation. I hope that... Uh, so I want to respond to your question. Uh, uh, by saying that uh, a lot of what uh, Harry referred to, the marketing uh, companies that uh, both Turks and Azeris are hiring, there was a banner on the highway uh, on Pennsylvania Turnpike, uh, uh, Azeris uh, and Turks saying, Azeris and Turks are ready to have a peaceful conversation with Armenia. Is Armenia ready while well, they are bombing and withdrawn uh, Armenia, they have a banner, huge banner on the highway with this message. It's com it confuses Americans yeah. because it's not in the, uh, uh, in the news, as you mentioned. So we have a lot of reports from Columbia University. If you, uh, uh, I can put my uh, email in the chat. I also put my, uh, the link to the essay contest in the chat for those people that asked earlier about it, essay and film contest uh, about what the legacy of genocide means to me. And we'll be happy to put my email. I have reports from Columbia University's human rights department. And uh, we have a panel discussion with a, a Turkish scholar and with uh, the Columbia University's Dr. David Phillips and another professor uh, next Saturday, the 24th at uh, 10 a.m. I'll put uh, the link in the chat and I hope that uh, we can see you there and you can hear from both Turkish, American and other perspective on this issue. Okay. Thank you, Rani. Sure. Any other question? Um, I like have a question. I have a question, um, right. actually, for Lara. Um, have you spoken with your children um, about your great grandmother's experience? Hi. Uh, yeah, we have. Um, um, so we go to you know April twenty fourth commemoration in Times Square every year, and we've brought our girls. That kind of became an entry point one April 24th um, so that they just, just to start a conversation with them. My, my oldest is 13 and my youngest is um, nine, almost 10 years old. So we, we kind of just try to teach them age appropriately. Um, and, and um, to, to, uh, to the question that was asked earlier, um, I think something that really needs to be shared with a lot of youth and people in social media also is that 
um, there, there are huge campaigns of like lies and deception. And so when you're a country like Armenia and you can't really get ahead of it, um, you know, um, where there was like massive groups of trolls and PR firms that were um, paid billions of dollars before this war, um, before this attack on, um, on Artsakh um, happened um, at the end of last year. So th there was just so many things that are, we, we almost like, we can't get ahead of all the lies. It is such a powerful, systematic machine and there's so much there's so much money that Azerbaijan has because of Turkey's backings that it's just it's very possible for for all the the truth to be muzzled and for there to be these um as Ani said these like big you know signs uh these big expensive flashy signs that can go up that could say hey we're the good guys we want to you know, we want to, we want to be friends with you. Um, and so I think it's really important. And I'm, I'm grateful for this kind of a forum where um, people can really ask questions and start to decipher, even with mm -hmm. big news medias, like that, that maybe all the information that's coming out from there too is not, is not accurate. And Lara, just to kind of touch on that point you just made, and I, th I think the reason why this is not getting the publicity that it should get, and, I'm, and obviously I'm not promoting any kind of violence or any kind of silliness, but the fact that you guys are so, you know, you're so law-abiding law citizens, <laughs> and you're all about peace, 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 but sometimes when you, when you see things happen, like everything else going on with the BLM, and all of a sudden, magna, all these mag like when you balance is going back and forth, it seems like that's the stuff that gets the attention. Yes. You know, so it's like if, if it's so one sided, then the other side doesn't win. It's like yeah. you're losing because you're being a, you know, you're being a, the reasonable people. And obviously, that seems like that doesn't work nowadays. I'd like to uh, add something to what Laura said. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in 2015, we were celebrating the 100th anniversary, and uh, I believe it was shortly thereafter that Lara's 13-year-old uh, got an assignment from school that had to do with Turkey. So uh, Turkey was the only uh, story that was mentioned in this book that they had to do homeworks. I mean, there were all kinds of homeworks, but instead of giving it a number of different ethnicity, Turkey was one assignment. Now, in there, you would say maybe it was solely innocent, but in there was... Uh, Turkey is one of wonderful country because uh, Children's Day and Independence Day are the same day, and it went on, and on until uh, I couldn't believe that. First of all, it was not accurate, but it was put in there, and our little uh, granddaughter, she was very upset. And by the time I found out why she was upset, I couldn't sleep that evening because I didn't realize that it affected her. So what I did is I got the title of the publishers, I got their contacts, and I started writing to them. First, it was difficult to find who was in charge and who is the marketing person, who's doing this. And uh, it was an interchange of about, I would say four or five months where we exchanged emails. I was trying to tell them that what they did was first of all, not academically correct. Second, you're just creating propaganda, uh, you know. So uh, after about that period of time, they basically, they did tell me that Mr. Million, we are going to review and probably not publish this story again. So that was just 
one little point there. But uh, we were doing uh, international night in uh, Eisenhower Park for 25 years. And we would always get a certain Saturday night in the summer. So we would have uh, music, dancing shows and every uh, country had a night. Usually everybody preferred a Friday, a Saturday or a Sunday. And then all of a sudden they said, well, we can't give you Saturdays or Fridays anymore, only Sunday and that's it. And then we saw that the Turks came in and they were getting Saturday night. <laughs> because they made a mess, that's why. And uh, they not only, yeah, but then they came and what they did is in two uh, different years, they got kicked out because they were putting prayer rugs. Right. They were doing prayers. They were doing all kinds of things that was really foreign to what you do in a park. Have fun. So uh, these are little things that really they create to manipulate uh, the environment, I feel, you know. Like I said, they, they will show how good they are to, to foreigners, but in reality, uh, it doesn't work that way. By the way, this uh, book, 40 Days of Musada, was given to me by my uh, uh, Jewish friend many years ago. And what he would do, he would go from library to library. And when he would find this book, 40 Days of Musada, he would bring it to me and I said, why are you doing that? Because he says, if the Turks found this book, they would destroy it. So it's better you have them rather than them destroying it. Mary, you want to say something? Unmute. Well, you know, I can, I can say something. My name is um, Mary Achi Malagiri. And I, I just want to chime in here. Um, you know, I ha I, and I am a librarian. I'm retired. But, you know, I'm sorry that your friend um, encouraged taking those books away because, you know, my dad had his own copy of that book, 40 Days of Musida, and we all read it. And um, it's a heartbreak. But to remove... The book from the shelves because it's a free and open society and i i don't believe they just would have been stolen out of the libraries and if anybody i don't even think it's in print anymore but um it might be and you can certainly get a copy of it i'm sure but uh oh but you know to take it away and to make it have it unavailable for people to read and to learn that's just that's criminal that is just criminal. So um, it just breaks my heart to think that that's what your friend did. Took it out of the library, gave it to you for safekeeping, and I'm sure you redistributed it. Yes. But you also, a lot of people could have benefited from reading it if, um, to make it available to everyone. That's all I have to say. That's my two cents. Okay. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to also share, uh, maybe Harry, you can tell them several programs we had at the UN on genocide prevention and how the Turkish Council will come and disturb the meeting and bang doors and throw chairs and yeah. then write curses on our programs. Every year we had to go through that. Uh, they would try to interrupt our... Uh our meetings, well, our presentations at the UN by just, you know, and we would tell them, you gotta wait till uh, it ends, but afterwards they would be sending insults that we would have to forward these insults to the secretary general. But this was a habit of theirs that uh, they just don't know what to do. So they insult you. They don't have a proper way of uh, of defending themselves. 
and engaging in dialogue because we invited them to dialogue and they refused to come sit on, around the table to talk. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Harry. Hi, Harry. It's Frank Stebbins here. Oh, and, great um, to see you, Frank. But you can see in my background, I do have the impeding clock behind me too. So I, I do want to acknowledge everyone's time, but I do want to say hello to Juliet and Laura. It's great to see you this time. And just thinking back to my own education on Armenia and its history, the, the evenings that we spent together and I spent with your family are more of an education than I ever received in any textbook or in any classroom. And just reflecting back on the time you spoke to my students, I am forever grateful to that. And also thank you for you and your family for sharing your story with us here tonight and for the Kane Holocaust Resource Center for bringing us all together. But don't also don't wanna lose the fact that so many of you are here for tonight at the end of the day. And thank you for being here for such an important topic. And um, while that was a quick, moment to try to wrap up the great discussion for tonight. I do want to turn it back over to Dr. Goldberg before we officially conclude. Thank you, Frank. Excellent. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Lara, and thank you, Harry, and everyone for being here tonight for this important program. I hope that this is the first of many occasions that we can all come together and continue learning. Um, I know I'm speaking right now for some of my students who were on the call. Um, that the lessons that you were able to offer them tonight, as Frank said, were greater than anything they were going to learn in a book. So thank you so very much. I will be sure tomorrow morning to send out information about the April 24th program, as well as the essay question. And there is a note down here. Oh, perfect. Um, thank you um, to send it. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for showing your support. Um, and I am going to turn off the recording now. People are certainly welcome to remain on and chat if they would like to. But just again, thank you and a big round of applause. For yes, definitely. Thank you for the knowledge, guys. Great, great knowledge. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Darrell. Thank you.